Do you ever wonder why we choose to adventure? Uh, really, throughout the course of this discussion, let that question weigh in on your mind. And um, yeah, let it marinate for a while. Let me know what you think about it. Because this question kind of burned a hole in my brain the other day whenever I was driving to work. I have a pretty decent sized commute. I'd spent all night playing Daggerfall Unity, because um, that's what you do whenever you're done with work and all of your after work responsibilities, right? You just stay up um, late into the night adventuring. Oh, <laughs> slipped into the lake there. Um, it, it occurred to me, the question occurred to me, why do I keep on adventuring? Why is it that the Elder Scrolls games and tabletop RPGs, um, fantasy literature, and um, these other forms of finding some sort of, um, yeah, adventure in general, why, why, does it, why do they appeal to me so much? And uh, I, I think in general there are two common responses that someone might have for this. The first one is, uh, oh, you just like it, lol. Uh, yeah, which is, that's true, but why do I like it? It's kind of a circular reasoning. Um, another sort of common belief is that uh, we play these sort of games for um, escape in general, or we read fantasy novels for escape from reality, things like that. Uh, that might be true sometimes, and um, it has been true for me in the past, but I think it's also a little bit reductionist and sort of misses the point for what brings us all back to this game. You know, saying that we play adventure games um, explicitly and exclusively for escapism, it kind of paints all of it in a sort of depressing sheen, in my opinion. Uh, it is nice to be able to take a break and escape from the hustle and bustle of our daily lives. Um, especially if we're going through something a little bit depressing, we want to take our mind off of it and feel sort of in control a little bit. That's totally fine. Um, but there comes a time whenever you move out of that depression and you still continue playing these games. So today I'm basically going to explore um, some of the causes I've come up with for um, why people like me might return to uh, role-playing games repeatedly. And again, this applies not just to Elder Scrolls and uh, video game RPGs, but to tabletop RPGs, literature, whether you're reading it or writing it. Um, and as we'll see later on, it even... I wonder what leveled up. I have the HUD off, so I don't really know. I heard the little sound effect, though. Anyway, we'll see that this applies... This love for adventure extends beyond just... Um, video games and other sorts of media and can also just be a, a way of life for how we in, uh, sort of interact with the world around us. Um, I want to frame a bit of this narrative by talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then uh, some scary dangerous ruins over there. I'm going to poke my head in hopefully. Um, oh, hello brother. Um, yeah, I'm going to relate this discussion to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, if you haven't heard of that, you might want to Google it briefly because I don't really, I'm not going to explain it super well, but basically Maslow's hierarchy of needs is this little pyramid, right? At the base of the pyramid is um, something that you need in order to physically survive, and then the further you up, uh, further up you go in the pyramid, uh, the more difficult to attain objectives lie. And um, the idea is you cannot obtain those difficult objectives without first conquering the lower tiers. For example, um, the, most, the bottom tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like you need shelter, food, and water, and sleep. Stuff like that in order to survive. Somewhere in the middle, there's, there are concepts like self-esteem, like knowing that you have worth and feeling comfortable enough with your safety and your capabilities um, yeah, to feel some sense of self-esteem and to know your place. Uh, beyond that, there's more gradients that I'm going to get into, but at the very peak of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is, uh, the way I understand it, I, again, could be explaining it wrong, it's sort of like uh, whenever you have goals that you've set out to achieve and you actively know how to achieve them, you know, not only are you confident, oh, stupid slaughterfish, I gotta get out of here. All right. Um, not only do you know how to achieve those goals, but um, you have a sort of, you have some sort of 
authorship over what your life is going to look like and how you can interact with those goals. I wonder what village that is over there. Anyway, um, to sort of frame this discussion, we can talk about how uh, adventures and role-playing games have their own little pyramid that you interact with. Uh, at the very base of this pyramid, like the things that you need to interact with, uh, it's like a baseline of you know, quests and content that you, the fe the player, get fed. Uh, so if you're playing, let's say, I'm going to talk about Oblivion a bit because it's the first role-playing game that really stuck with me. If you're playing Oblivion, you might join the Fighters Guild and start questing in the Fighters Guild, and you're like, oh, this is awesome. You start leveling up, you start doing all the quests, kind of fast traveling from lo one location to the next and doing the thing that the game tells you to do. It's awesome. Um, after that, you might end up joining the mages guild and even though you only start off with two spells you can start um questing for them you'll end up doing the thieves guild dark brotherhood also you kind of go around indiscriminately picking up quests um exploring dungeons and dude this rat is persistent uh let me go ahead and take care of him real quick Anyway, at the bottom of this pyramid, as far as, you know, adventures and role-playing games are concerned, I don't know what you want to call this, Micah's Hierarchy of Adventuring. At the bottom of this pyramid, it's straight up just consuming the content that the game gives you indiscriminately. There's nothing wrong with this playstyle, but if you've uh, watched this channel at all before, you probably already know that I crave something a bit more, uh, I don't know, in-depth, a little bit different than... Um, what that playstyle is conducive to. Uh, so, yeah, the bottom of the pyramid is just going around consuming content. Oh, dude, slaughterfish. I really wanted to go, like, grab some more some pearls from this area, but I'm honestly, like, I'm not well equipped to handle slaughterfish even. Uh, yeah, I'm just the greatest adventurer ever. Just get scared away by slaughterfish. Um, yeah, in the middle of this pyramid, we can find like the idea of sculpting a character that belongs in the world that fits in narratively and um yeah it's like um getting a bit distracted by the combat music that's something i appreciate about daggerfall is that it doesn't do the dramatic combat music for every little encounter anyway um in the middle of Micah's hierarchy of role-playing is the wedge that describes belonging in the world from a character's perspective. Your character makes sense, they have strengths and weaknesses, and have a little niche that they fit into. Um, this character right here, he's kind of like a thief, kind of like a cleric. And uh, as you can tell, combat is not his strong suit, and since he's just getting started in the world, it's going to be that way for a long time. Um, that's okay, I chose to make a weak character because this is just the way he belongs in the world. Um, there's also a sort of social interaction component with this that he'll likely end up adventuring with other rogues uh, of his caliber and might serve his deity. And this doesn't necessarily uh, lock me out of other guilds in a gameplay sense, but just from a person who wants to play a character who belongs in the world. I should put clothes on as well. Um, yeah, I'm less likely to go join, like, um, the Redoran guilds or uh, Great House whenever I'm playing a character like this. And those limitations are great because they, um, they make your character feel like they belong in the world. And so up at the top of, uh, let's call it Micah's, you know, hierarchy of adventuring is what I'm going to loosely call narrative autonomy. Uh, you know, you have some sort of control over your character's direction, just as in um, in Maslow's hierarchy, whenever you reach the pinnacle, you have self-actualization. Well, in this case, we're just um, sorry, adjusting the music over here. In this case, we are... Uh, we're having some sort of narrative ownership over what's going on with our character and we use our character as a our character and the world I should say uh, that they inhabit as a vehicle to experience some sort of catharsis um, and I think this 
that word right there. Uh, this guy could be scary. I don't know if he's hostile or not. It doesn't look like it. That, that word catharsis is going to be pretty um, central to what I'm discussing here. Rather than saying that uh, role-playing games, video games, tabletop RPGs, rather than saying that they are strictly a form of escapism, I'd rather assert that they are a really fun way to achieve a level of catharsis that our day-to-day -day lives don't always bring about. Uh, what's coming after me? Is this a, it's a scamp? Okay, let's amscray. Yeah, I really want to get into this dungeon and find whatever loot might be within. Let's hop up here, hop up here. Can I make it over here? Oh, yeah, it's too far away. Uh, can he shoot anything at me? I don't know. Okay, so yeah, after introducing my little hierarchy of uh, adventure and role-playing, let's talk a little bit about cathartic experiences and uh, how role-playing games help us to achieve those. Um, let's see... Whenever we're playing a role-playing game, we typically have a, a hero that we're piloting. It doesn't always have to be like a uh, traditional hero, of course. You have many games that allow you to be um, a less reputable kind of character. They're not exactly moralistic, or they are anti-heroes. But I believe that part of the charm of playing role-playing games is that we get to see the traits that we either wish to see in ourselves or wish to see in others embodied in some great hero uh, or even a meek or cowardly hero as we're seeing here. Um, so I tend to want to play characters who are really combative with... Uh, okay, <laughs> this, this is a poor example. Don't use this character as the rule for all the characters I make, but I often make melee characters who um, have a sense of honor to them, and that's because that's how uh, I think I would explore this, this kind of world if we weren't, you know, in capitalist America or something like that. Um, so these, these heroes often embody the traits which we wish to see in ourselves. Um, oh man, or we wish we could pursue in ourselves. You know, I, I'm not really a very combative guy, but there's been more than one occasion where I consider how I would fare if like, I was confronted in a situation where I would need to protect my wife and my son. And I hope I can be these like Wades and Reeds from my Daggerfall videos who can just, uh, you know, put his dukes up and start defending his family if need be. Uh, even though I've never been in a fight in my life and I hope I never have to. Um, yes, yeah, music is a little bit distracting. I think I'm gonna cut it out actually. Yeah, sorry Marwin music. It's just, I get tired of the damn combat music. Um, I'm literally just walking away from scamps. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the heroes in video games, they they embody the traits that we wish to see in ourselves or in others. Um, but we obviously play a lot of characters who are not heroes um, or who are... They, they don't exactly follow any sort of code of honor or a sense of uh, nobility that the traditional, uh, you know, renaissance type of hero would have. Uh, I'm really struggling to find the interior of this Daedric Ruin, by the way. I feel like I'm just, uh, I feel like I'm going to cheat by pulling out my map here. Um, is this it? Oh, I found it. Okay, let's crouch down. Oh, finally we have a light source. Okay, uh, where was I? Yeah, so... Basically, the characters that we play, they embody the traits that we either wish to see in ourselves, we wish to see in others, or they uh, they embody traits that we wish that we could pursue. Uh, for example, this character right now is sneaking around in the shadows hoping to steal some loot and peel out of there. Um, I'm not really this way anymore, but I have a bit of kleptomania in my blood. And I find it very thrilling to... Uh, this could be dangerous. That person has ebony armor. Let's back out. I find it very thrilling to 
have to duck and run uh, from some sort of opposition. Uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe video games imprinted this on me, or maybe just my experience has imprinted it on me. Uh, but I'm a good boy. I don't get into trouble with the law these days, and I believe that, you know, whatever you do, you should have nothing to hide. And so, um, I don't get to be a thief in real life, but I can have a sort of cathartic experience by playing a thief in a video game. Uh, okay, okay, we're in danger. We are in danger. Uh, let's go ahead and pull out my, uh, moon shadow ability. Ah, that's dangerous. Okay. Yeah, and we're just going to see how far we can get, how much loot we can find before having to dip out of here. Uh, am I going to lose it by... I think I'm going to lose it by interacting. Oh, yeah, I already blew my invisibility. That sucks. Okay, we're just going to start running. Yeah, this guy cast that spell. Um, <clears throat> let's go further down. Why not? Oh, crap. Uh... Don't kill me, don't kill me. Okay, I'm getting stuck. We're just gonna dip out of here, I think. Oh, Jesus. Oh, dang. Uh, well, that was unfortunate, but at least we can just um, chill inside a safe location. I'll turn the music back up. Yeah, so I get to play Thieves in games like this to have a cathartic experience once in a while. Um, if you are religious you'll probably know uh, how great it is to play clerics or any other sort of religious figure in video games like this um, where you get to kind of explore the game's uh, faith in a way that is uh, meaningful and probably represents whatever you do in real life as well uh, but in addition to the more obvious point of how heroes in these adventure games and tabletop role-playing games and things like that Aside from the obvious point that they represent aspects of ourselves um, that we admire or aspire to have, uh, I think there's also a point to be made that the enemies and the things that we encounter in games also, they, they kind of reflect a bit about ourselves also. Um, they reflect what our society might fear, what we might fear. They reflect... Um, things about ourselves that we might not want to acknowledge. A sort of baseline for understanding this concept is to look at the werewolf. This is like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of figure who... Um, he has a bit of a temper, you know? He might be a normal person during the day, but then at night or whenever the moon is out or what have you, they transform into something that is um, cataclysmically dangerous, it has a temper that simply cannot be sated. And even the saints among us have um, issues with tempers as well. And so in this sense, I wonder where I've found myself. Can I grab a couple of things from in here? Let's see what kind of book this is. Oh, prisoners currently held in Pelagayad. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Gonna steal this armor and try to get out of here before the guard notices me. Yeah, um, what was I saying? Villains and enemies and monsters in general that we encounter in RPGs, they kind of hold a mirror up to us and they give us something that we either identify with and don't want to identify with, or they just blatantly spell out uh, things in our environment or in our world that we fear. So, to go beyond the example of the werewolf, you can also think of the, uh, the vampire as it's described in works like uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, as these are kind of representations not only of like danger, but there's something lustful about them. At, at least in um, classical like depictions of vampires. Uh, another example of a monster that kind of reflects a society's danger to us is... Um, you know, if you think about uh, zombies, these are like the classic idea of wanting to live forever, but it's turned on its head uh, because we certainly don't want to live forever if it's in a constant state of hunger like that. You can also consider a ghost as a representation of uh, the grudge that you don't want to die with and how it would be just like 
uh, unending torment if you were to die without having settled the score or made your peace with a loved one who, you know, you really want to have made your peace with even if you're not willing to admit that with yourself. Um, Pelagayad is really beautiful. This is my first time playing Open Morrowind with this, or Open MW with this, um, this little level one character I have. If that tells you how long I've been away from Morrowind, this is actually my first character that I've played in uh, Open MW. It has not disappointed yet. Uh, yeah, there's actually a sort of linguistic precedent. This might be reaching some. It, if you think that, that's totally fine. I, I understand. There's sort of a linguistic precedent for how monsters show something to ourselves. If you think about the Spanish word for show, uh, it's called monstrar or monstrar. I, I'm not pronouncing it well. Um, and a monster in Spanish you'd call monstruo, uh, monstruo, I suppose you might pronounce it. Yeah, they're very similar words with just slight changes. It's almost like the monster is, has the word show embedded in us. Um, you can also think about monster and its relation to the word demonstrate. Uh, that one has the kind of monst in the center of it with the added bonus of having the word demon up front. Again, this is could just be incidental, it could be reaching, but I still think it's fun to think about. Um, yeah, other things that are revealed about what we fear are things like um, impending cataclysms, as with, um, you know, games like Morrowind, where there's some dark uprising, there's social upheaval that we fear, and in this case, we have a cathartic experience where we can rebel against it and cause, you know, change in the world, which is, we don't always have the liberty of having in our actual lives. Um, but I'm sure this is all much ado about nothing. You've likely heard these connections about, um, how we want to have our self inserts in video games and how enemies are maybe you haven't heard about the uh, the thing about enemies who knows regardless i want to move on to the um my next point about why i think i keep playing adventure games they give you a very solid sense of progression the progression is very tangible and quantifiable is this really the room they rented to me it has someone else already up. in it Get what the hell man She's telling me to go away. Dude, I rented this room. You go away. My crime has been reported. Whatever, bro. Report me, report me. Oh, I was at the wrong door. Oopsie. Um, yeah, there's a tangible sense of progression with these things. They're just going to have to come wake me up to arrest me. Wow, this couldn't have come at a better time. Yeah, we're leveling up as I'm talking about progression. Uh, what does this character want again? Definitely not strength. How about agility and willpower? That'll work for me. Okay. Oh, look, the lighting has changed in the windows. Yeah, there are many different ways that you experience uh, progression in real life and in video games. I'm going to show my my sort of roleplay autism here a little bit. Uh because it's obvious that role-playing games imitate real life, right? But I've often trained myself to see it as the other way around, as I, um, let's disable the HUD again. And that, like, whenever I'm trying to accomplish things in real life that seem daunting or challenging, I think, okay, well, this is a good opportunity for your character to level up, so let's just, like, stick with it and be consistent, and then you'll see that progress. Um, this happens in hobbies as well as just whatever vocation you've chosen for yourself. Uh, I, I do tech support currently for a living and often whenever I get like a really really difficult challenging case I'm like oh damn I really don't want to like figure out what's going wrong with this person's Amazon workspace. I don't even use the damn application. How am I supposed to know what's going on here? And yet through the act of talking with the user and learning what they do to interact with the uh, application, I end up coming to some sort of understanding about how I should proceed. Um, and by the end of it, like I've learned a little bit about um, the application that I didn't previously have. I'm like leveling up in real life. I, I want to go check out this dungeon right here, but I know that I'm going to have to run away and I'm all out of intervention scrolls. Let's go check it out anyway, whatever. Um, 
you also have in like IRL progression through things like practicing a language. Uh, my Spanish, as you saw, is terrible, but previously whenever I worked in restaurants or was really in any situation where I was in closer proximity to, uh, yeah, there's a ghost right there. Let me just see if I can grab anything off this body. 18 gold pieces, man. I'll take it. Fancy pants, sure. Yeah, sorry, dead body. Yeah, we're just gonna dip. Yeah, learning a language or whatever hobby you might have. Um, if you're anything like me, you spent a lot of your uh, childhood and adolescence really like turning your nose up to physical activities and exercise, but have recently grown uh, way more fond of it. And so just as, are those pearls? I think I might be able to get some pearls here. Uh, yeah, real life and video games, uh, tabletop RPGs, things like this, they all are all almost in a, at least to some extent, they encapsulate a feeling of progression that just feels very cathartic. And the good thing about progression in video games and tabletop RPGs is they're typically much more attainable than what we have in real life. Like I personally, I have a goal of being like a really great father and provider for my family. And the fact is like I might die on the way to work and like my goal gets cut short. Um, quick side note, Hudson, if you're listening to this like 10 years from now for some reason, I love you and you mean the world to me. Um, just in case, you know, in case that little car crash does happen. Um, but yeah, in video games, you can either reload your save file or just, you know, uh, you have magic spells. Like whenever I was about to get killed by uh, all those danger worshippers, I just noped out of there. It's that simple. So your the progression that you set up for yourself in video games, it's so much easier to attain. And uh, beyond just improving your skills, you get to improve your gear, you get to increase your wealth. It's just, um, it's fantastic being able to have that kind of cathartic experience uh, as you achieve your goals uh, in real life and in video games. Because like I said, they uh, resemble one another. And uh, yeah, if you're anything like me, you've already learned how to uh, find the connection between role-playing games and real life in order to uh, make the laborious task of improving and progressing uh, in your real-life grinds a bit more tenable. Uh, quick side note. One important part of progression is the possibility of regression uh, because, you know, Bilbo Baggins would have, his adventure would not have been the same if he hadn't ended up floating down the river in a bunch of barrels. Uh, I've got to actually go through and remove combat music from, like, my game or something. It's just so annoying. Um, outside of how it's annoying to record while it's going on, I also don't like that I could just be walking down the road and not know that I'm about to get jumped, right? Oh, but whenever I start hearing mu music, I'm instantly on alert. Anyway, um, there's a lot of literary precedent and historical precedent for uh, misadventures and setbacks leading to character growth and, in the end, more progression in the long run. Um, the example that comes to mind for me, this is going to be super embarrassing, but people that know me in real life already know about it. I... Uh, Whenever I was in high school, I was like 17 years old, I got arrested for stealing Magic the Gathering cards from Walmart. Uh, yeah, I know, it's it's ridiculous. I was really into Magic the Gathering. This is like the time whenever Return to Ravnica was being printed and I just wanted to get some mythics and rares that I, I didn't have a job and my family was poor, so I was never going to be able to do it. Didn't even have a printer for proxies, right? So um, I did some hood... Um, some hood rat stuff in Walmart. This is kind of a synthesis of my uh, troubled background as well as my uh, nerdy hobbies overlapping here in a perfect way. And, uh, you know, I was on probation for like over a year and honestly uh, messed that up at just about every opportunity. Um, just gonna. Oh, I got a pearl out of that one. And. As a young man, like, I was 17 whenever that happened, and I know you're thinking, like, you can't be tried as an adult whenever you are um, that young. Joke's on you, buddy. In the state of Texas, they don't give a shit, man. If you're 17, you're on the hook for whatever you do. Um, so that was really, like, a blow to my morale at the time, but it was also a very formative experience for me. Now that I've made it through the turmoil of, like, probation, 
messing up probation and like finally finding some light at the end of the tunnel and realizing that my actions have real consequences like you can be bitter about it um, or you can take it in stride and it's this way that your trials and tribulations sculpt your mentality that um, it's kind of how regressions lead to progress is I guess what I'm trying to get at here and this is why I'm an advocate of whenever you're playing role-playing games not reloading all the time you'll never know um, what kind of great benefits will come from you running into some sort of setback or consequence I'm gonna try to get some more pearls here even if this slaughter fish comes for me um, okay pearl see if I can get this one. I keep opening them, but it doesn't give me the pop-up about my inventory, so I'm guessing... Oh, that one has one. Um, anyway, uh, setbacks are very important for our growth. Uh, if we don't take any risks, then we're unlikely to reach our goals, and risks are defined by the possibility of failure. Failure is just a simply a pivotal part of our growth as people. And again, since video games and uh, tabletop role-playing games, since they mimic real life, uh, the concept of regression and progression are inextricably intertwined with this little hobby that we have. So yeah, whenever I consider why do I keep adventuring, well dude, we get to just have these great moments of um, sort of breakthroughs in our that that yearning we have to progress and feel stronger it it's given to us in a much more concise and often more beautiful manner in video games and role-playing games um, speaking of beauty I, another reason why I find myself playing games like Daggerfall or Morrowind Oblivion or tabletop role-playing games is the uh, sheer joy of allowing our natural curiosity to um, be satisfied through our um, our craving of exploration. I think it, as humans it's kind of a universal thread that goes through all of us where we want to learn more, we want to explore, we want to see our surroundings and we want to uh, immerse ourselves in something new that maybe someone has not discovered before but or at least feels new to us. Um, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and turn on uh, music again. Ah, uh, that's nice. Yeah, I in hindsight, I should have just gone back and had music off the whole time and thrown it in later, but I'm too deep into recording to care about that now. Um, yeah, we. I, I think if you've played role-playing games for long enough, you'll understand, like, uh, the first time you explored Morrowind, your, your jaws might have dropped at the foreign land... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there we go. Your jaws might have dropped at the like huge tree-sized fungus, um, at the netches flying about and things like that, that are just completely foreign to us. And you can't wait to see what's around the next corner because uh, it's your the first time in your life that you're going to experience that. And it's the last time that it's gonna be your first time experiencing it. And this is um, it's just something that role-playing games simply excel in. I remember one of my most fond memories as a dungeon master was playing, um, it's, a, it's a setting that I would describe as sword and planet, so it, it sort of has the feeling or the aesthetic of a sword and sorcery RPG, uh, where the heroes are not super powerful and it's sort of low magic. Uh, however, there's some interplanetary travel involved and essentially we lived in a solar system where a an asteroid belt would perfectly orbit the solar system and these asteroid belts would have often have dungeons on them or they would have populations of outlaws and rogues living in them and so me and my my friends we'd have a little party of adventurers who would go out onto this funky asteroid they'd either climb up a mountain to hop onto one or they would use uh, an elaborate rope and pulley system or if they were rich enough they could eventually buy a ship or create a ship to get out there um, anyway the point is whenever you were exploring that asteroid belt you literally did not know what was going to be around the next corner uh, you often were finding flora and fauna that 
is not native to Earth, and so it felt really cool and new. And I would dangle some magical items in there, like a... Um, I remember one of them was a sentient chain that was made out of jade. And the player finding them is so wrapped up with the question of what the hell that it becomes its own little side quest to learn about this thing that you found. I often found myself just dropping in little set pieces like a skull that had carvings on it or a, uh, a slab with a strange like system of writing on it. Dude, I don't know what those things did. I just knew they looked cool and that if the players picked it up, I would figure out what the thing did later on because little tip to all right, my budding dungeon masters out there, you're going to get burned out really fast if you try to come up with all those details up front. Just let it happen organically and let the uh, the players have a say in what they um, what the things might mean. You know, okay. Without getting sidetracked too much, this is part of what I mean. Whenever my buddies were exploring the asteroids, there was a part of our like ancient humanity that was being satisfied by being able to explore and ex express our natural curiosity as humans. I think this curiosity can kind of get beaten out of us in the real world. As children, it's very easy to, like, the world is literally still new to you whenever you're a child, uh, but it's a bit more difficult whenever you're starting to grow a bit older to feel that same sense of wonder. But it's still possible, I, I promise you, it's still possible. Um, Man, I still have combat music playing. Look at that guy. He's still following me. Oh, that's cute. Uh, anyway, I'm just gonna let it ride because surely he'll like leave me alone once I get to Vivek. Uh, yeah, like I said, I have this stupid roleplay autism that makes me start to view the world around me as re its relation to like a roleplaying game rather than seeing the the relationship in its inverse, which is, you know, that RPGs mimic real life, not the other way around. Um, man. Anyway, as I, um, I, I should bring up that one of my favorite hobbies that I've been obsessed with here in my mid to late 20s is rock climbing. I mostly have done this in indoor gyms, uh, but I think like, uh, I, I don't know what happened. I I live in, like, North Texas, so I wasn't expecting to find any places to uh, climb outdoors. But I really love hiking and spending time in nature. And so I eventually just, like, went to, I think it's called Mountain Project or something like that. And uh, started looking up rock climbing places near me. And I was, like, really shocked and... Um, kind of impressed that I found some hits like there's some spots in my area where if I drove out and made a bit of a journey and did a little bit of exploration I would be able to actually climb on real rock uh, it's much more dangerous to do it this way which makes it even more appealing I would say which is uh, uh, probably something I shouldn't admit to uh, but yeah so I went out and I just kind of went to the small town by this river system where a bunch of limestone had been eroded and um, where evidently there might be some... I'm going the wrong direction. I'm trying to get to the foreign quarter. Evidently there might be some places for me to climb outdoors. And so once I got down there, I had to like traverse this... Um, just to sc scout out the area, I had to go down these slopes and let's go southward. I, was I going the right direction? I guess I was. I had to go down this really steep riverbank and I eventually, like, I just I was ready to give up. Like, I couldn't find the place where I needed to go in order to climb. I, uh, I saw that way, way out in the distance, there was, like, um, this cliff face that looked like you might be able to climb it if you had uh, ropes and anchors and harnesses. I mostly do bouldering, which, uh, for the un uninitiated, means that you climb up a much shorter height than what you might have seen in the movies um, or in Daggerfall and other video games. Um, and instead of... Oh man, I was, <laughs> whatever. I, I got turned around in Vivek City, go figure. Playing with the HUD off, can't even see which way I'm going. Uh, yeah, I was about ready to give up whenever I saw that cliff face and the river was there and I'm like, oh dude, I don't have a boat, what am I gonna do? But the river was kind of short or what am I trying to say? It was a bit more shallow at the time. And so I, I kind of remember standing there at the uh, riverbed or at the bank of the river 
and I stood on a rock asking myself, uh, like, am I an adventurer? And this question, silly though it may be, it kind of made the decision for me. I'm not saying that you should make dangerous choices with that in mind, like you got really drunk at the bar and you want to drive home. Hmm, am I an adventurer? No, take an Uber or whatever. Um, but in this moment, that question kind of decided it, uh, my situation for me. So I took off my shoes, I took off my socks, and uh, yeah, I just I dipped my toes in the water and walked across the river, and it was... Um, the water was chilly, the rock was slick, uh, but it was really, really beautiful at the same time. Uh, once I finally got to the other side of the river, though, rock on the other side while I walked upon it. it. It dried my feet well enough for me to put my socks and shoes back on. And I continued around this slope. I could kind of see that other people had beaten a path here before. And as I turned a corner through this like forested area, I saw these huge, beautiful boulders, man. Like something that I literally just, I foolishly did not believe existed in my like part of Texas. And I'm like, oh wow, I was, completely humbled and completely in awe and feeling so grateful at this discovery that I made because it felt like I was the first person I guess to have made it but also because I could tell that other people had been here before there were some makeshift crash pads of like taped up pillows and shit thrown around don't if you go climbing please use something better than pillows it's simply not safe um oh dude I pressed the quick save button Oh man, I can't believe it. I went to go turn on my HUD and I accidentally hit F12 instead of F11, which caused me to load my quick save. So I just uh, just took a Silt Strider back to, uh, yeah, back to Vivek in the foreign quarter. I hope I didn't lose too much loot that I stole or whatever. But um, yeah, as I was saying, this rock climbing experience was really beautiful and cathartic for me, but it's experiences like that are few and far in between in real life but they are out there you know if um, you might think that you're like the world itself has already been charted and mapped and like you have to either you know go to the bottom of the ocean or Antarctica in order to experience something new and fresh uh, but no it's honestly just like in your backyard it's in your neighborhood it's in your town in your city you just have to have the right mentality to go out and find it uh, having a hobby of some sort that takes you outdoors in particular also helps with this. I know a lot of people will likely bring up urban exploration whenever we talk about this. I haven't really engaged in that, although it does interest me, so I can't speak to it much. Um, but yeah, part of why playing video games and tabletop role-playing games is so fascinating is because you have this feeling of, uh, you know... What's, what's the word for it? How do you how do you describe it? I guess we can use the word catharsis again. Uh, but you have a beautiful cathartic experience of finding something new and finding something fascinating. I thought I had more than one pearl. I must have reloaded. Oh, gosh, that's a bummer. Do I still have the armor to sell? I do. That's good. There we go. My offer's refused. Yeah, so you can uh, play video games and tabletop RPGs to, or read a book or write a book. I don't care. Do whatever um, provides this catharsis for you. It's um, it's really a thing of beauty, if you ask me. And um, video games just happen to be a very good vehicle for that kind of exploration. And uh, whenever I ask myself, whenever this question about why I play RPGs was really burning in my brain uh, as I was driving to work last week. Um, I consider how into StarCraft Brood War uh, my family is and how good at Halo Infinite my brother is. And I'm like, man, those games are so cool. I wish I was as good at those games as uh, those other people are. Or chess, that's another competitive game that I just think would be really fun. And yet I know that I'm not going to dedicate the time of my short life on this earth that is needed in order to fully enjoy those games and so whenever i was asking myself like why why is it that i and my uh the rest of my family is they're not as quite fixated on these kind of experiences as, as i am this is the best um 
reason I could come up with is that I, I really fiend for these really cool cathartic moments that are provided to you through video games, tabletop RPGs, and uh, books, fantasy literature, and even historical literature to an extent. Uh, there's one last caveat that I want to describe, and that's the um, the joy of NPCs. And um, it kind of fits in with exploration. This is more like a social adventure than uh, your traditional kind of adventuring that you might imagine with sword and shield and potions. But they are adventures nonetheless. And like I said, I have this sort of roleplay autism that makes me start to see life like a video game. And you've probably heard of people being referred to as like having a main character syndrome where they think that they're kind of the center of the world or uh, I can't cast this yet. Or similarly, you might um, have seen memes about calling somebody else an NPC because of how generic they seem. I think it's actually kind of humbling to see yourself as the NPC in other people's lives. For example, at the rock climbing gym I go to, I'm, I'm literally just a person that a person, another person is going to talk to like um, in brief exchanges for a couple of hours here and there. And uh, at some point, as much as I love this hobby and I love those people, uh, we're never going to see each other again. And that's okay. It's like your hobbies and the places you go to... Uh, my goodness, turning down the music again. There we go. Uh, your hobbies, the places you go to through necessity or out of leisure, um, they allow you to meet uh, interesting new people and you get to play the role of an NPC in their lives, which I just think is pretty, pretty cute in its own way. Uh, let me get out of here. I just rats in the sewers. By the way, I'm really looking for the Thieves Guild. I, I've heard that um, there's a section of the Thieves Guild that lives in or is housed in the Foreign Quarter. I can't find that thing to save my life, man. Don't tell me. Please, comments. Like, let me figure it out. Um, but yeah, I just keep wandering around the Foreign Quarter, going to places I've already explored, looking for the Thieves Guild. Um, yeah, anyway, I think it's pretty cool to see yourself as an NPC in other people's lives and um, you can kind of go up to people in real life and just I know that if you're anything like me you might have encountered some sort of social anxiety in your life but if you see yourself as an NPC who understands the overall inconsequential impact that you're going to have in a person's life you might feel a bit more bold to go around and introduce yourself to ask about things like the latest rumors don't ask it like that you know talk to them like a human um this is why i like having the pretense of a hobby like rock climbing because you can sort of break the ice by talking about like oh what project are you working on um when did you get started in rock climbing how long have you been doing it what's your favorite kind of like route to um experience things like that if you have a hobby to ground yourself on uh it's a lot easier to find these kind of dialogue options like we have on morrowind and then to click on them um so one caveat here is that you should read the room whenever you go around. Don't literally click on every NPC. Uh, and if the NPC's dip disposition is getting lowered, you know, take a hint and move on. <laughs> but this is just one way that I broke out of my social anxiety was to realize that I'm just like a drop in the bucket of uh, a nearly infinite amount of human interactions that others are going to have. Um, interestingly enough, some of those... Uh, experiences will be a little less fleeting. Your social adventures might culminate in friendships or romance uh, or just one really cool experience that you can hang on to. Um, one day whenever I was rock climbing like a year ago, I was working on a route that somebody else wanted to work on. We took turns working on it. We were both failing at it. And this guy decided that he was going to leave. And as he was walking off, I was like, okay, one more try. So he came back to watch me try. And that was the time that I sent the route. And it was so cool to have my bro there watching for me. And um, we've been climbing buddies ever since then. And um, yeah, it's just these little NPC interactions that you have where, uh, you know, you don't expect it to go anywhere. You think that you're just clicking these little dialogue options, but it grows into something so much more than that. Uh, this is why you should not be afraid of your fellow humans. They are usually craving the, uh, 
their own cathartic experience. They have something on their mind that they probably want to share with you. Uh, we live in a world that is absolutely shaped by stories. We tell stories to one another, we, tell, we find stories in video games, and we live stories every single day. And usually the people that you meet and interact with are more than willing I, I think they're actually overflowing with stories and they're just waiting for an opportunity, sort of like a writing prompt to tell you their story. Uh, and this is part of why this world that we live in can be so beautiful despite all of its um, dangers and tragedies. Um, I, I just love being able to share stories with people like that and to hear other people's stories. Um, I, I think I'm... Oh. <laughs> I was about to say that I'm about to be at the end of my rope, but who could forget that we were talking about role-playing games this whole time? Uh, to talk about a couple of memorable NPCs that make for cool, cathartic experiences, uh, we're playing Morrowind right now. Diviath Fear, however you say that guy's name. You'll find this wizard in the main quest whenever you're exploring, um, trying to find a reason to cure the Blight disease, and his experience is one that will awaken the natural curiosity that lives inside of humans, at least I think so. Um, because of the shape of his tower, because of the dungeon beneath it, and because of the crazy, bizarre-ass lore that surrounds him and his daughters. Yeah, um, I don't want to have to tell you about that. Go learn about it yourself, man. It's bizarre. Um, in this same dungeon, you go downstairs into that dungeon, and you find that there's... Um, a dwarf with like I don't want to say too much but you know the dwarves are supposed to be extinct but here one is right before your very own eyes and it's just a, such a cool experience it feels um, like you've discovered something new and uh, yeah it scratches that human itch of discovery that I think is in all of us uh, anyway I, I really think that I'm at the the end of my rope for this discussion about why I personally love to adventure. I think rather than using it as escapism, believe me, I have done that, but that's not what it's all about. Um, beyond the traditional explanation of role-playing games being used for escape, I think they're also just really cool methods of achieving uh, cath um, catharsis. You reach experiences that you wouldn't otherwise experience in real life. Uh, and to those who might say that, well, you know, I don't think anyone watching this video would have this complaint. But I've heard some say that video games are just like an excuse to not interact with the real world. That might be true for us whenever we are young or depressed. But this day and age, like, I'm a well-adjusted dude in my late 20s, and I just like to use video games and tabletop role-playing games as sort of supplementary cathartic experiences that go along with the ones that I already live, like, in my day-to-day -day life all the time. And they are here. They are here awaiting our, um, our authorship as humans to go imprint our identity upon them and to have received really beautiful experiences from them. And there's no medium in the world quite like the role-playing game. And this is just one of many reasons why I adore them and cherish them so much. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about why you play role-playing games, whether that's tabletop RPGs or video games like Morrowind. Um, because surely my little rant here was not exhaustive. So yeah, in the comments, tell me about why you love to adventure and what um, what these games awaken in you. Okay, thanks for listening to my ramblings again, and um, yeah, take care.